Good afternoon, everybody. Greetings from Los Angeles. Welcome to all the PAC members and to the many guests from around the country and from around the world, I hear. Welcome. Uh, if this is your first PAC talk, we're happy to have you with us today for a very special presentation. Uh, my name is Marjorie Ornston, and I represent the Events Committee of the Photographic Arts Council Los Angeles. And we're an independent council of photo collectors and photo lovers, and we are committed to an evolving conversation, inviting the people of Los Angeles and beyond to be engaged, inspired, and empowered by photography and photo-based art. So I think you can see our Instagram address is here, um, Photographics Arts Council underscore LA. I hope you'll check us out. We have talks almost every weekend this summer, which is really pretty exciting. Every week this summer, Fridays mostly, but other times too. Um, and we've expanded our mailing list. So if you are interested in learning how to talk, please log on to our website, hacklosangeles.com, and uh, sign up for our mailing list. And we're happy to inform you about everything that's going on. So speaking of engaging and inspiring through photography, we're certainly going to be doing that today as we learn about a very exciting exhibition, The Sights of Wonder, photographs from the Royal Tour of 1862. So in a nutshell, in February 1862, 20-year-old Albert, Prince of Wales, was sent by his parents, the King and Queen of England, on a four-month-long tour of what was then called the East. So he visited the Holy Land, what's now the West Bank in Israel, Constantinople, now known as Istanbul, and Egypt and Greece. And the purpose was to educate the prince in history of the area, religion, politics, and statesmanship in order to prepare him for his future as king. And in the true royal fashion, they took along a photographer named Francis Bedford. So please keep in mind as we view these photos today that the photographic process cameras, plates, and printing had just been introduced in 1839, making the process just 23 years old. So in 1862, at the time of the tour, photography was still considered a new and very novel medium. And in fact, many of the sites had never been photographed before, which help us, helps us see them with very different eyes. I think you'll agree. I found this exhibition online from another Anglophile friend of mine who was sending information about streaming theater from London. And it happened to include a promo for this recently opened show from the Barber Institute of Fine Arts, which is the campus art gallery at the University of Birmingham, Birmingham pardon me, in England. And when I first began to view the images in this online exhibition, following the very sophisticated yet easy design I was thrilled and shocked, and it is such a great story told in such a compelling manner. And I often like to examine what it is about images that keep us so entranced. And in this case, for sure, it was a sense of wanderlust, a feel of a vacation while you're sitting in your living room, and a little bit of time travel thrown in as well. It just seemed a perfect fit for a talk like this one that we'll hear today. So we're going to hear not only about photography, but also about painting and architecture and the amazing combination of skills that came together along with opportunity for the photographer Francis Bedford. The curators of the exhibition examined not only these photographs, the remnants of the trip, but how the tour was portrayed, presented and accepted by the British at the time. And it really fleshes out the impact of the trip and it adds further evidence to the power and the influence of photography. So I was lucky to find Grace Trumbo, a co-curator of the exhibition through the website, who responded quickly to me, even in the midst of three days of travel, it took her to return from school in England, four flights and then a four hour road trip in the middle of COVID to get her safely to her home in Washington state. So welcome home, Grace. Uh, Grace received her BA in art history from Whitworth University in Spokane, Washington, and her master's in art history and curating at the University of Birmingham. 
She's one of the 10 master's students that created this exhibition, which was scheduled to open at the gallery in mid-June, but was quickly changed to online due to obvious circumstances. So Grace's talk today will be about 40 minutes, and then we'll shift to question and answer discussion. So please chat amongst yourselves in the chat room link and present your questions in the question and answer link. And if at any time during the presentation, the images freeze up, please hang in there. It will come back. It's just a little sketchy internet and it clears itself up. So I'm really excited to share this with you today. Um, it's a lovely exhibition. I thank you all for being here and please take it away, Grace. Thank you. Let's set up the screen share right now. So thank you, Marjorie, for the lovely introduction. Um, as Marjorie shared, my name is Grace Trumbo, and I am one of the 10 curators of this online exhibition. I'd like to start by thanking both Marjorie and the Photographic Arts Council for giving me the opportunity to share these incredible images to you this afternoon. And also thanks to the Barber Institute of Fine Arts, the Royal Collection Trust, based in Windsor Castle, England, and the University of Birmingham, who sponsored the show. So without further ado, I will start. To give you a brief overview of where the talk is going today, I would like to share first about the route of the Royal Tour and a bit of context and background and how it was planned how it was started, some of the key figures who went on this tour, including the Prince and our photographer, Francis Bedford, the historical significance, and also how Bedford's photographs participated in other artistic representations of these places that they visited. Towards the end, I'll take a visit to our online exhibition, which is an independent website. I'll share some highlights of the photos that we selected for show and talk about some of the multimedia learning that we were able to incorporate in our exhibition. And then if we have time at the end, we'll have a few questions and answers. So to start us off, I'd like to share quick images of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. They were behind the planning of this royal tour, and they were the parents of the Prince of Wales, who is the key figure of the tour. Prince Albert was very interested in photography, and he was um, the main person who was putting together the itinerary for this tour. Unfortunately, Prince Albert died in December, which was a few months before the tour was scheduled to depart in February. But after his death, Queen Victoria was very adamant that everything stay on schedule. So the tour left Windsor Castle on the 6th of February. And you can see the route here on the left with the bit of detail on the lower right. This map here is what we created for our exhibition to show some of the key locations that the tour visited, although it doesn't highlight all of the smaller towns. So the route followed um, the route of the Crusaders, including Richard the Lionheart. So there was a religious importance to the chosen locations they visited. They started at Windsor Castle, went to Egypt, down and up the Nile, moved into the Holy Land where they were able to visit key biblical sites such as Bethlehem and Jerusalem, and then continued on to the Ottoman Empire with Constantinople, which is modern day Istanbul, and finally ended in Greece and Athens. You can see in the geography of this tour, it was four months long, but it had many different goals. So one of them was political significance. So the tour was meant to provide a way for the prince to practice his diplomatic skills and to be kind of a representative for Britain abroad. So some of the key places he visited included Corfu in the Ionian Islands over here by Greece, where he visited with the king at a time when um, the Ionian Islands were being transferred to Greece and there was a little bit of political uncertainty around that. So it was a chance for Britain to show which countries they stood behind. Down here in Egypt at the same time, we had the Suez Canal being constructed. And this was very important for trade between Britain and India. So it was important that uh, the Prince and his royal entourage were able to check up on these partners. And the Ottoman Empire was also weakening. So Constantinople was an important place for many international leaders who were looking at it. The other thing is the biblical significance of the tour. They were able to include the Holy Land in these locations here in the eastern part of the map. In Victorian Britain at the time, most people were Christian. And so not only was it important for the Prince to learn about politics, 
but also religion, because as future king, he would later become King Edward VII, he was also going to be assuming the title of Defender of the Faith, so he had to be familiar with some of these key religious sites. So who was the prince? Well, I've included his carte de visite here, which is kind of like a calling card or business card back then. Prince Albert Edward was only 20 years old when he went on this tour. And besides being religious and political um, in importance, he was also being sent as a way to improve his public image. Shortly before the tour commenced, he had been caught up in a very public scandal with an Irish dancer. And this caused his parents to um, worry a bit. And <laughs> it helped them see that he needed a chance to prove himself because he was going to be the future leader. And so they wanted a way for him to kind of step up to the plate and mature a bit. So the tour was able to reform his reputation and introduce him to his future duties. And throughout the tour, many members of his entourage were able to see that he was a very competent leader and he was very personable with all of the diplomats that he met with. So it was really good for him to meet all these people. Some of the people who were added to his royal entourage that he went with included military veterans, military generals. There was a man who had fought in the Crimean War, which was a significant part in Britain's history shortly before. They also sent along a reverend who gave um, weekly sermons, and of course the photographer, which is this figure here, Francis Bedford. Francis Bedford was the first photographer to accompany the royal tour, and he had actually done the commissions for the royal family before. So Francis Bedford hey, was only- me, Grace. Yes. Hi. So it seems there's quite a bit of echo from your room. Oh. I'm, getting, I'm getting some feedback. I'm wondering if you can get closer or if you have headset. I can get closer. Okay. Does it sound better? Um, Does it sound a little bit better? Speak again. Hello? Does yeah. it sound better? Yeah. Okay, I will stay here. Sorry about that. Do you have any other, is there any other equipment on someone saying? No. Um, you might be hearing the computer itself. Okay. Fan on, so. I don't have um, headphones, so okay. I can change that. No problem. But I can try to stick something behind and see if the sound becomes a little bit quieter for you. I will just be sure to speak loudly. And yeah, stay where you are now. It sounds a little tighter. Perfect. Okay. Thank so you. So as I was saying, this is Francis Bedford. And he had done a couple commissions for the royal family before the royal tour commenced. So he had taken photographs in Coburg and Gotha for Queen Victoria, which were some locations where the Prince of Wales had actually spent time as a boy. And the Queen was very pleased with his work. Photography, as we said earlier, was a very new medium at this time. And the royal family embraced this. Francis Bedford had started out his career in printmaking and lithography. He worked for Day and Sun Company in London and he very quickly um, adopted photography as his new medium. He took about 200 images during the tour, and he was able to exhibit 172 of those photos back in London shortly thereafter. And another relation that he had to photography in London was that he was actually the co-founder of the Royal Photographic Society in 1853. So the tour was heavily covered by the press, and as you can see in this short excerpt, excerpt that I've included here, um, as early as February 5th, it was announced in the court circular that he was chosen to accompany the prince on the royal tour to take photographs of landscapes, figures, and architecture of the sites that they visited. The tour also improved his reputation, and following the rest of his career since, he was able to say that he was photographer to the Prince of Wales on all of his card seats. So his little calling cards that he had as a photographer included this uh, stamp here on the bottom. So you can see how important this was to his reputation as an artist and as a professional because he had been able to add this trip to his resume, so you might say. It was a huge jump in his career. All of the photographs that I'll be sharing in this slideshow are by Bedford, unless otherwise stated. 
I'd like to share a little bit about the transportation of the Royal Tour. It was four months long, and in 1862, most of the transportation was actually done by ship. You can see here on the left, the HMY Osborne, which was their main mode of transportation as they crossed the Mediterranean Sea. Of course, when they got to the Nile, they had to have smaller boats, and they did a lot of walking. They took some trains, um, and they also got to ride camels, which are photographed here on the right. So we'll talk about this picture a bit later. But this is just a great comparison to some of the transportation modes that they experienced. They were very um, engaged with the environment because at the time, transportation options were quite limited. Here we can see some of the lodging that the royal party enjoyed. There were about 10 members in total, including the Princeton photographer. But at each of his locations, local uh, royalty or local leaders were able to assign at camp attendants to help them. And so here is one of the camps that was set up in Lebanon. And on the left, we can see the British consulate building here. This building was actually set up to host the prince when he came and they had rooms ready and everything. But when they arrived on site, the prince requested camp, uh, camp instead. So they had all these tents set up and he was able to stay outside, which I think speaks to his commitment to really get to know the local community and to experience everything in first hand. I love this photograph on the right because the photographer would have had to go up on top of a hill or on top of a building to catch this large scenic view. It's a bit of a candid photo because no one is posed. You can see everyone going about their daily tasks, but you can also see the distance of the city. Here's more buildings stretched out in the background. And if you look in the far back, you can see a ship in the center and on the far left, so you can see the ocean spread out here. The prince kept a journal throughout the whole tour, and one of the entries that he made on the day they arrived in Lebanon talked about the environment that they were in. He says that there were a lot of people that came to welcome them, and it sounds like it was quite a party, but at the same time, he says they were, quote, nearly smothered with dust, but with the crowd and our large cavalcade, unquote. So they got to experience desert weather <laughs> very closely. One of the goals of our exhibition, Sites of Wonder, was to ask the question, how did Bedford's photographs participate in existing Victorian British perspectives of the Middle East? We wanted to ask this question because these photographs were not only historically important for the way that they documented the sites the Prince and his royal party visited, but they were also artistically important. So we wanted to see what other ways were these sites in the Middle East represented to the British audience. If we take some time to look at this photograph, we can see some of the themes of the tour expressed in the sites that Bedford chose to photograph. We can also see Bedford's technical skill. So this photograph on the left depicts the monolithic shrine and it was taken in Edfu, Egypt, and it's a great composition. So Bedford was very comfortable with landscape and architectural photography. He didn't take a lot of portraits. And here in the way that he composed the image, we have these repetition of rectangles coming out here. We've got almost three or four layers coming in a diagonal. And this draws the eye into the center where we see this inner courtyard and inner shrine. At the time of this use in ancient Egypt, only priests would have been able to access this space. But in 1862, when the royal party visited, um, anyone would have been able to see it. The way that Bedford was able to capture this depth will also capture in the detail is incredible. It really draws you in and it's a very intimate photograph. You want to take time looking at it. I've included the detail that he was able to show. He used what was called the wet collodion process, which had only been around for 10 years. And so the fact that he was able to master this so quickly um, is really incredible. You can see in the detail, some of the figures are even distinguished here and in the relief on the right. So this photograph was important in his collection of photographs that he chose to take because it was a historic site. You can see one of the local figures, which gives the picture scale, but we can also see his skill as an artist. Another aspect of the tour that was very important was the religious aspect. So Victorian viewers back in Britain would have wanted to see these biblical sites because many were familiar with the biblical stories. The Royal Party visited important sites such as the street 
called Straight, which is where Paul in the Bible is said to have converted to Christianity. But they also visited sites that would have been looking different shortly after the tour. On the right, we have a photograph that was taken in Egypt. And shortly after Bedford took this image, this temple right here on the right had actually had to be moved because of a dam construction. So there was a religious significance and also a documentary. In these images, again, you can see Bedford's familiarity with architectural elements, and he's very comfortable in showing depth and detail and how he composes it, his image. Here we've got the rule of thirds happening and that the temple is in the upper right corner. And here with the street called Straight, you can see the one point perspective drawing the eye back. They're stunning photographs. Again, we have biblical significance showing up in these two images. The royal party was able to visit Jerusalem and Bethlehem, which would have been important. And I love these images because while the foreground may not be quite as interesting, it's really the background that draws you in. Both of them are arranged a bit similarly in that the front is very plain and flat landscape, but on the left we have this path meandering back which takes your eye to the middle ground and the background where there is Jerusalem spread out, including the Dome of the Rock right here. And then with Bethlehem, you have the repetition of the windows and the doors and the stark background in the sky. The reason why the landscape images have such a stark contrast against a blank sky is because of the exposure time. So most of the photographs would have had to be exposed for about 10 seconds to capture the image, depending on the amount of sunlight. And because Bedford had to choose which, which part of the photograph to focus on, he obviously wanted to show the landscape. And so that was at the expense of the sky. And that's why in many of these photographs, you can't tell if it's day or night or afternoon. Another important aspect of the tour was the political significance. Like I said, the prince was able to visit with the king of Greece um, at a time when he was actually about to be disposed. And so here we can see Corfu, which Bedford photographed. This was an important trading site. And so for the prince to be doing his royal duties and visiting with these international leaders, taking photographs as proof of his role and his responsibilities was very important to bring back and share with the Victorian audience because it showed that he was the responsible leader. Another political religious leader that he was able to meet with was this figure on the right. This is Abd al-Qadir. And this man was known for being a gentle and kind soul because shortly before the royal tour visited this place in Damascus, which is photographed here on the left, there had been what was called the Druze Maronite conflict, which was kind of like a civil war with the local Christians and the um, local higher class, which was a group associated with Islam. And because of this conflict, about 20,000 Christians died. Now, Abd al-Qadir was able to rescue a lot of people from the massacre. And because of that reputation, the prince went out of his way to meet with him, to spend time with him. This portrait is one of seven portraits that Bedford took on the tour. So we know it's a very important figure that he was able to meet with. And here we can see a bit of the contemporary politics. Whereas the biblical sites were important for knowing um, what these sites look like according to biblical tradition. This photograph of Damascus shows more contemporary politics and how Britain was interacting with um, local issues in the 1800s. And finally, one of the reasons these photographs were important is because they're aesthetic and they're very beautiful to look at. Like I said, Bedford was the first photographer to ever accompany the royal tour. And so it was important that not only he showed these sites for their historic, biblical, and political importance, but he showed them to look beautiful. In these two images, we can see how he knows to arrange architectural elements. So he had special access as a photographer to some of the sites, such as Dome of the Rock, which previously had been closed off to Western visitors. Because Bedford was traveling with the prince, he got royal access to these um, closed off spaces like this religious site. And so many of the photographs he took at Dome of the Rock had never been photographed by British photographers before. So this was really cool. And he took his responsibility seriously. You can see this stunning image, it's so beautiful. 
in the detail that he captured and the figures he included for scale. He often included two or three figures. None of them are ever labeled, but they do show how these spaces were interacted with by the local people at the time. On the left, we have an image called the Fountain of the Sultan Selim. And this was a common public space for travelers, visitors, pilgrims to stop and get a drink of water. Um, here you can see the spigot on the left. And so it was a public meeting place, but it's also architecturally beautiful. If I included detail here, you can see the incredible amount of detail that Bedford was able to capture. On the lower left, you can see these gorgeous Islamic tiles, and you can see all the layers, even the crenellation happening here. These photographs are only about nine by 11 and a half inches big, which is about that big. And looking at them in person, they really draw you in because you don't expect there to be so much detail and clarity in these images as they're so old. But when you zoom in, you can see how talented he was despite the climate that he was working on and the new equipment that he was um, managing. Another interesting way that we were able to answer our question about how these photographs were received back in Britain was to do some case studies with Bedford's photographs and artistic representations of these sites. So these two objects we included in our exhibition because they are a great comparison between how groups were depicted in painting versus photography. On the left, we have a photograph that Bedford took of the royal party resting after a sermon. Here we can see the prince sitting on the rock. He's quite casual looking. And these two figures on the left are a cousin and his wife who came to visit during part of the tour. And the figure on the farthest left is an artist whose name is Jemima Blackburn. She came and stayed with him during a short part of the tour. And during that time, she was able to do a sketch of well, probably multiple sketches, but she was able to do a sketch of this event, which is seen in this watercolor here on the right. So this depicts the Prince of Wales, standing here under the um, shade umbrellas, receiving some gifts from an archaeological dig site in Egypt. We have a mummy that he was gifted, that's depicted here, and he was also given other historic objects which were excavated. Here is the Egyptian ski lay that he was given. This is still in the Royal Collection Trust. And this is a really interesting watercolor because, for one, the color is really beautiful. But also we can see how there was artistic license taken in this scene. Well, Bedford had to stand and finish his photograph on site. And he didn't have very much control over how the figures looked. Jemima Blackburn, who did a sketch, was able to take a bit of artistic license in the way she completed her painting. She sketched the scene and then finished it back in her studio. One of the ways that we see her taking artistic license is in the way she depicts the Colossi of Memnon. So these two white figures seen in the background, right up here, these are known as the Colossi of Memnon, and I've included a photograph to give you a sense of scale. But from this location in real life, you can't actually see these figures or these sculptures. But she included it to probably include interesting details that were related to the scene to fill in the background, I don't know why, to make it look beautiful. Whereas Bedford wouldn't have been able to do that. He was really stuck with what he had, uh, but at the same time, he was able to arrange his figures in an aesthetically pleasing way. Some of the other comparisons that we can make between his photographs and paintings are shown here. So on the left, we have the fountain again. This is the full, full view of the Islamic tiled wall that I showed earlier. And this image actually confirms some of the artistic representations of these sites. So on the lower left-hand corner, I have a watercolor that shows the same building. And here we can see how accurately some of these places were already represented in art. So Victorian Britons would have been familiar with images like these. And to see photographs that Bedford took of the sites, it would have helped confirm how they already thought these places to look. Another cool thing about photography is that it was able to capture the same amount of detail that a painter might paint in his own work. So in this example, we have a painting done by Lawrence Alvatadema, and you can see some of the hieroglyphs and paintings along the back wall in the columns. And maybe standing here at this distance, you may not be able to 
capture all of these details by the naked eye, but because it was a painting, Tadema was able to include such details. With Bedford's photograph, he was able to capture it in, capture it in the photograph. And even on this far wall, we can see individual hieroglyphs and reliefs. I have another comparison here of Jerusalem. So this was the biblical important site, not only to um, Islam, but also Christianity and um, to the Jews. And if we compare this to this lower image, which is a bit more idyllic, we can see how similarly the scene was composed. I've included a detail of Bedford's photograph because you can see the Dome of the Rock here. And this again is to stress the incredible detail that he was able to capture at such a distance. And then my last comparison is here with a watercolor that I've included of uh, a place at Baalbek. And this was actually completed in the same year that Bedford um, showed up on the oil tour. And what's really incredible is you can see the column leaning against the wall on this upper photograph. And you can see that mirrored again in the things on the bottom left. So these would have been an incredible addition to all of the paintings, watercolors, sketches, or drawings that British audiences would have seen before. And it would have either confirmed or helped refine their understanding of these places that many people would not have been able to visit before. The tour was covered by the press in weekly announcements. And we included some of these in our exhibition to show, again, how the photographs participated in this previous understanding of these sites. I like this one here because in the scene on the lower left, you can see this image of, well, it's an engraving of the prince standing here on the left, and what we think is Bedford holding up this glass plate here. This would have been the glass negative. The caption says, His Royal Highness examining the negatives taken by Mr. Bedford, photographist at Pele. On the lower right, we can actually see the portable tent that Bedford took, which he used to expose um, his photographs and um, develop his photographs. And then we can see his camera set up right here. This is an amazing engraving because if we compare it to the actual photograph that Bedford took, here we can see his tent again in the lower right. I've included a detail on the upper right hand corner. And this is really cool because this was a portable tent that he took with him everywhere he went. We know that Bedford would have had to plan out exactly how many glass slides he needed, uh, how much chemicals he needed and all of his equipment beforehand because many of the things that he used to expose and develop his photographs wouldn't have been found in these places in the Middle East. So in England, he had to measure out exactly how many things he needed and he would have had to be very careful in the way he transported them because many of the chemicals were quite sensitive. And then working on his photographs in such a small tent as this, was even more impressive because he was dealing with the desert climate. There was heat, there was sun, wind, and sand. And even just this image in its depth and clarity speaks to his talent and his technical abilities as a photographer. In this image on the right, we can see some of the challenges that he overcame with photography as a new sort of tool for capturing these scenes. We have the Prince of Wales here sitting on a camel towards the center. I've included a detail here on the lower right. And if you look at this image, you can see one camel to his left is out of focus. We also have a bit of the camel's head on the right that's out of focus and a figure here on the left, oh, right here. So like I said, he would have, the photographer would have had to have the figure sit still for about 10 seconds or less. In this image, we can tell that some of the camels weren't able to follow those instructions. And so Bedford had to choose which figure he was going to focus on. Since the Prince of Wales was obviously the most important figure in the royal tour, he chose to focus on the prince to get him and his camel in focus at the extent of some of the other figures in the image. That being said, this photograph is still an incredible image because you've got the pyramids showing the sense of scale, and you can see all of this detail in the bedrock in the background and still make out an individual writer or two right here in the background. 
And you can see this engraving on the left that was uh, inspired by Bedford's photograph. While some engravings were very serious and documentary of Bedford's work, others were a bit more satirical. Uh, the public was very familiar with Bedford's skill before he went on the tour. And so this sketch that was included in a local magazine or newspaper was a bit satirical in that it showed how Bedford was less comfortable in photographing portraiture. And so you can see Kitten's taking his photograph of the Sphinx, which is obviously a monument to see me still. Jones, however, thinks that in this instance, he has been extremely successful. So these are just really fun to look at because we can see this conversation between engravings and paintings and also Bedford's photographs. So that is the news coverage that I wanted to share. And I'm going to now switch over to the online exhibition to show you how it is laid out. So when you go to our website, which is Sites of Wonder, you will be able to click Enter Exhibition. And it takes you to the images that I've just shared with you in the same order chronological order of the Royal Tour. This is an online website that is open to anyone, accessible to anyone. And it's really cool because unlike a physical gallery, you can visit it in the comfort of your own home, which is what we're doing now. So when you enter the exhibition, you are first met with the prince, some background information about him. Hi. Hi. So it didn't go to your website. Oh, just a moment. Can you see it now? Yes, and please continue to move a little bit closer forward so we can hear you a little more clearly. My apologies. That's okay. Okay, so now That's we can all see our online website. I built up the suspense showing it without, um, <laughs> talking about it without showing you. But here it is. Like I was saying, this is accessible to anyone at any time. And when you land on the website, you can click on links to the university the Royal Collection Trust and the Barber, which is the campus gallery. But the first thing you would probably want to do is click on Enter Exhibition. So this takes you to the photographs in chronological order of the tour. You have a bit of information introducing the prints and introducing the photographer. And then um, some labels about where the tour went and some of the historical significance like I talked about earlier. I recommend that you come back and visit this later. I'm just going to scroll through slowly, but it's really interesting because it's the first image, for example. With all of the photographs in our display, it first takes you to the image where you have the option to click on it. And then on the upper right hand corner, you can click the zoom in option and zoom in on the images. Again, incredible detail for such an early time in photography's history. This image itself is actually one of the cover pages that was included in the catalog of photographs that Bedford published when he came back and exhibited his work in London. And so we, we can see how he chose to frame the image and introduce it. At the time, these sites were known as being in the East. Today, we would say they were more in the Middle East to be precise. So when you're done looking at images, when you come up to the top right, you can click on the text. And then you can come down here and click on information. And this takes you to the label. So this is similar in how you would walk through a gallery. You can look at the image, you can read more information about it. And then our tour continues on into Egypt, which was the first location that they were able to visit. Some of these really cool photographs that I shared earlier. And in some of our images, if they have important details that we thought were worth uh, highlighting for you ourselves, besides clicking on the image to zoom in and see the whole thing, you can find a button here under the label that gives you a close-up. And here you can see, again, the clarity of these figures included in the scene. You wouldn't have thought that the photographer was this far away from the people who was photographing them. But 
once we zoom in, you can still see everything very crisp. And you can see the expressions of people. So as I move through the images, I'm clicking on the arrow on the right, but you can also move backwards by clicking on the left hand arrow. This is the journal that the prince kept on the tour. He kept a daily record of everything that they did, the places that they went, and the people they were able to meet with. And what's interesting is that while he was very objective and very detailed, he didn't put a lot of emotion or su subjectivity into his writing. And we think this is because he knew his mother, the queen, would be able to read it shortly after. So it was not so much a journal like we would keep today, but more uh, a general account of the places that he was able to visit. One really cool fact is that if you're very interested, you can actually view the full journal online. All of the pages have been digitized and they are accessible to the public through the Royal Collection website. Here we move into sites in the Holy Land, Lebanon, places of religious importance. With this image of Bethlehem, which I shared a little bit early, earlier, I like to zoom in on the left because here again, we have the similar challenge that was in our blurry camel photograph. On the left, you can see some of the donkeys lined up here, and you can almost see this ghost outline of one figure and his donkey. And this again is because it's a more candid image. So Bedford was up on the top of a building taking this shot. People didn't know he was up there or maybe they did and he wasn't telling anyone to pose or anything. And so we can see what a daily life looked like in this place. And this would have been fascinating for British viewers back at home. This is a really cool image. It is a group shot of the camp attendants at Beirut. And it was an honor for these people to have been assigned to help kind of be servants to the royal party when the prince arrived in town. Well, this isn't an architectural photograph, it still shows Bedford's skill as a photographer and how he masterfully used the environment in which he was in. On the right, we can see this railing and stairwell coming down towards the center which is mirrored by the shadow caused by the building of the roof line on the left. You can see the diagonal coming down. So there's a symmetry in the way that the image is composed. And the symmetry is strengthened by the figure on the left, who is sitting and facing inward, and the figure on the right, who is also sitting facing to the left. The dark and light clothing is nicely balanced. And we also have the tallest figures standing in the middle. So this is a great, uh, a group shot of everyone, you can see the local clothing, you can see um, the environment that they were in. So we've got dirt ground, maybe a rug sitting under them, but a contemporary building as the backdrop. This is a fun image to zoom in and see the details. Everywhere you look in these images, it's almost like playing a game of I Spy because whenever you zoom in, you get all of these different patterns and in incredible clarity. And you can even make out on the left hand corner the date and the location, which Bedford was able to etch into all of his negatives. And then on the lower right hand corner of every photograph that he took, he also put his signature right here at Bedford. So he knew that this store was very important for his career and he was very intent on making sure his name was in everything. This image is fun because you see here the temple of Zeus, which is in Athens. On 
the background, you can see the Acropolis. And in the foreground, we have the temple, which is in ruins because it actually didn't stand for very long shortly after it was built. But what's really fascinating is when you zoom in, you can see the figures here at the base of the columns. We don't know who these figures were. Initially, we thought that this might have been the royal party, but the royal party actually visited the site in Athens a few days before, and Bedford returned later to photograph the site. So these are unidentified sitters. They might be locals enjoying an afternoon break, um, socializing. But if you look closely, you can see on the lower right, we have tables, chair, chairs and the table brought out. And sitting on this table on the right, in the lower right hand corner is what we would call a hookah. So a smoking pipe, which would have had marijuana and other herbs. And it was very popular with local residents, but also uh, British visitors who were kind of touring the place. And we can see another pipe here on the ground in the center. And the fact that we can see these in the images blows my mind. This is a close up again of the figures here with the pipes in there. Towards the end of the exhibit, we included the news coverage. And then this is the order form. So Bedford exhibited 172 images of the 200 he took back in London at the German gallery. And he was able to commercialize his work. The Queen gave him permission to sell his photographs uh, to make an income on them. He made two fancy bound photographic albums for the royal family, but he also made additional prints to exhibit and then he sold prints individually. So here we can see how the photographic series is uh, categorized into location. We've got section one in Egypt, section two in the Holy Land in Syria, and then section three, which is Constantinople, Mediterranean, Athens, etc. And there were multiple pages on this order form, and some of the images had additional notes that Bedford might have added that he thought were historically significant. But the British public, anyone could order the photographs and add them to their own collection, which would have been quite a novelty. And the photographs were lauded by critics. So we know that he was quite successful in selling his images. So once you've scrolled through all of the images, it will take you to our index page. And this gives you the option to see all of the objects that we've selected for the exhibition in one place. You can scroll down and see all of the Again, and you can go back and click on images out of order should you want to go back and look at them. And then after you've had a good look at the photographs, say that it's hide and seek and found all the interesting detail, you can go up to the right menu and click on discover more. And this is all of our multimedia learning that we were able to incorporate to the website. Now originally this was planned to be in-person delivery, but because of the gallery shutdown in March, uh, we only had a few months to transition to making an online exhibit, and so we were quite proud of everything that we managed to include in our website despite the, the time challenge. On the right, we have the photographic process. This is a video that the Royal Collection Trust produced talking about how these photographs were made and the challenges and technique and steps that Bedford would have had to uh, accomplish correctly to make his images. And we have a second image on the lower right, which is an illustrated talk. And this was put together by one of the curators of the Royal Collection Trust that we worked with. It's a fascinating video. He talks about the history of the photographic collection, which is held at Windsor Castle. We also have two little pages here introducing the photographer and the Prince of Wales. And you can click on these to read more about who they were, um, some of their interests, and why they were historically important. You can click on our exhibition guide, which is a downloadable PDF. And this gives you the option to read it online like you would a gallery guide that you've attended. Talks about, again, the Prince, Bedford, some interesting comparisons between photography and painting. And then should you be more interested, there is also a list of additional readings located 
located in the back. There you, go. you can see it on the upper left part of this page. We also have other downloadable documents here in our home activities. And these are for children, older students, adults. They're great reflective pieces should you want to do a bit of creative writing while looking at the images or learn more about how we look at these photographs through post-colonial lenses or with themes of the architecture and the British Middle Eastern um, conversations that happen when we visit these sites. So you can view these again online or print them. They also include web links to other resources. And finally, in our multimedia learning, we have my favorite element, which is our interactive map. So this is the map I showed you earlier, but on the website, you can actually click on some of these sites and it pops up a photograph representing the place itself, where you can click on the image, it takes you into the exhibition at that image. And you can just have a bit of fun, it's interactive, so can't go wrong. On the upper left hand corner, there's also our travel and accommodation, which switches to another page and talks a little bit about the transportation that they were able to use and some of the accommodations that they employed. So that is all the multimedia learning. I'm going to go back to the index just to end my little talk here. Um, that was everything I had to share with you. I hope that I've been able to impress upon you the historical, the political, and the religious significance of the Royal Tour, and how we're able to view these photographs in comparison with other artistic representations of these sites. They're a fascinating selection of images, and it was quite a challenge to narrow down our display from a choice of over 100 images to just less than 20. So it's a lot of fun. I hope that you come back and visit it online at your own time. But that concludes my slides. And I think we're going to open it up for questions. Grace, that was marvelous. That <laughs> really, really was marvelous. Um, I, I thank you guys for all hanging in there. The sound was iffy. I did get your messages that it was difficult. I hope you all cranked up your volume and got through. And many of you are, all of you are still with us. There's about 70 of you out there. So that's nice to know. I and, apologize um, for that. No problem. Your insights were really great. I feel like I've been around the world and back. Oh, good. I, really, I really do. I felt that the first time I viewed that, um, I just think it's really an exciting set of photographs and the presentation is marvelous. Um, going through the website again, I, I never tire <clears throat> of looking at those long shots. I have to say one thing I was impressed with was Bedford's lack of intimidation when it came to scale. Mm. I mean, it, it's just extraordinary that he was able to just continue to shoot these pictures in Greece and uh, in the Middle East from far away and still maintain a sense of composition that is relatable, you know, and to know that so early on uh, in a place that he'd never been, obviously nobody had ever been, he couldn't prepare and draw. So I just, exactly. I just yes. think that's kind of knockout. So there were yeah. some questions about the glass plates. Are you familiar with the negatives and the plate size, and they were all contact prints from the glass? So the images themselves were nine and a half, nine by 11 and a half inches. And the glasses were exactly the size of the photograph. So he could make as many copies of the photograph as he wanted. And he used what was the wet collodion process. So it was a chemical mixture that he used to treat the surface of the glass. And then you have to did it overnight, then you had to, um, it, was, oh, it was a lot of chemicals. Um, once the glass was treated though, you had to store it in a dark room or in a dark box, which I think, I think is what mainly they used before exposing it to the sunlight. And then again, he had to come back and continue almost like a science experiment, um, all of these different layers and washes to expose the image completely. And as you mentioned, he had to sort of measure and plan to bring enough material obviously for the trip and he had limited amounts so he couldn't really mess with it. Yeah. So the prints ever used uh, the prints, the photographs by yes. the 
prince as gifts to dignitaries. Uh, did he ever oh. exchange the prince during the tour? I don't know the answer to that. I do know that the prince had a really beautifully bound book of all of the images. So it was expected that he was going to share the photographs with friends and family um, visitors because the queen specifically requested that they have this. And it's kind of a, we looked at it in the, in the um, archives. It's a very large book and it's bound so that there's one image per, per page. And so we know that it was intended to be shared with visitors to the, the royal household because it's beautifully bound. As far as copies given to the foreign leaders, I think because of the ease of making multiple copies, it's very likely that they would have shared photographs with mm -hmm. the people that they met with. Um, but I don't know who specifically are the details of that. Yeah. So Roger asks, says that some tours of this nature were also designed to gather military information. Mm. Do you know if this was any part of his tour? I don't know. It could have been because we know that there was a political importance. This was shortly following the Crimean War, and it was also following the um, Jews Maronite conflict, which had happened in um, Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem, I believe. And so there was a lot of contemporary politics at play. The Ottoman Empire was weakening, Egypt was also becoming more independent. And so Britain was looking at these places and trying to figure out where they fit in, in relation to the other um, political powers. And because the prince was scheduled to meet with all of these different leaders, and because there were people in his entourage who had already fought in wars for Britain or were generals and um, you know, decorated veterans of different armies, I'm sure that they were thinking about this as they met with other leaders. So it was really a very early example of diplomacy. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like the royal tours that we think about today. There's multiple different goals um, it's not only just making sure that there's a good public image of the royal figures, but it's also checking up on your international partners and showing that you're doing your duties as a leader of your country. Right. Wait, there's a couple more questions. So um, he did indeed make the prints on location and he did he, you think he made more when he returned with the plates? He did, yes, because he was able to sell the photographs and exhibit them. Yes. And of course, someone's asking about staging. And it seemed to me there was mm. sort of a combination of staging and candid both. That is one of the big questions that really interested us is to what degree of objectivity were these photographs taken? Because there is this sense of truthfulness in the image because it's a photograph and you can't really alter it that much. But at the same time, you're an artist who's taking these images and Bedford knew how to arrange the architectural elements in comparison with the people, in comparison with the animals. And so in some images, we don't see figures at all. In others, it's almost like he intentionally made sure to include them either for a local representation or a sense of scale. But we don't really know. That's one of the fun things of looking at these images is how much was Bedford really trying to create his idea of these places. Yeah. I believe that he felt very fond toward these sites and he really liked them because he captured the way these places looked in a very poetic and beautiful way. And it just draws you in. It's very intimate, makes you feel like you're there. Yeah. And so I believe that he really fell in love with how these scenes were and he wanted to show that to the British audience. Yeah. So Larry asks two questions. Did Bedford make technical notes? Um, and they were wet plate collodion. Indeed, you said that, yes, I believe. Yes. And so he did in, indeed uh, have to print them there. Correct. Uh, technical notes. Hmm. Not that I know of. Okay. Uh, he had already been a photographer before the tour, so I'm sure he already had familiarity with working with large scale buildings and, you know, putting people where. Mm -hmm. I don't know as far as if he kept a journal or gave directions to others. He was the only photographer, so it was all up to him. <laughs> yeah. And do you know the paper that he used? Was it a unique um, paper? I don't know what type of paper. We were able to look at these photographs in the archives at Windsor Castle. Um, it's a thin paper, so it's not like a heavy cardstock, but the image is this 
the 9 by 11 image, but the way that it's mounted is on a larger sheet of um, paper here. In the way that, um, I don't know the type of paper though. Okay. I think when he, when he gave, when he made the copies for the prints though, it was important quality paper because it was going to the royalty, but I don't know if that changed depending on. Well, I'll tell you, it was the right paper. Because it was, it was the paper that captured the most detail. <laughs> and the fact that the, these images, I think the most um, impressive thing to me is to be able to, to zoom in just from right here on my laptop and look at the details of these images and know that over, you know, 150 years ago, uh, he captured these people and these places, these sites. It's, it's really an extraordinary uh, achievement of Francis. And I, I so much appreciate you sharing uh, all the time you spent. Yeah, it was really fun. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Can you tell me again, please? I'm sorry I didn't put down the um, the URL of the Barber Institute where the show is. Sure. Let me, um, I can actually bring this up here. I've got it right here. We go to I have a link right here. So if you go to barber.org, can everyone see this? Yes, barber.org, barber.org.uk slash sites dash of slash wonder. Mm -hmm. And this takes you to the gallery's website where we've got the link to the online exhibition here in the upper red rectangle. A video that is made by our, by our vice chancellor of the university. And then we also have some gallery talks or audio guides, you might call them, yeah. where some of the curators have chosen either one image or multiple images to talk about more in depth. And there are also just some videos to watch. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that because I've, I've scrubbed the whole thing. I've been through it more than many times. And now you did mention to me the other day that more videos are being added all the time. So so that, you know, <laughs> yes. that will keep we us coming back. Bad. <laughs> okay, I hope everybody got that. And um, the, the, uh, many of the images are related to work that's in the Royal Collection. This is Royal Collection work that's just at the Barber now. But these photographs are all owned by the Royal Collection. Okay. Yes. Thank you guys, everybody, for your questions, your feedback. I think I really tried to get uh, to everybody's questions. And again, I, I hope you enjoy it. Um, thank you for sitting in with us today. PAC, as I said, has a lot of talks coming up. We have one next Friday about Gerhard Richter, photography and painting. So if you're interested in sticking with us, go get our, um, check out our website and sign up to our mailing list and you'll always be informed. And I wanna thank Grace Trombo again. Thank you so much. Thank it's you for having me. An audience, but we're getting a lot of thank yous. Great job, very interesting. Great job. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. And I thank you guys again for coming today. We're a little after four o'clock. That's pretty good. And there's um, 60 of you. I appreciate you hanging in there. And thank you so much, Grace. I'll talk to you soon. You as well. Bye-bye, everybody.